site specific data collection in order to come in and uh, to frame up a construction operation plan. And we call that our site assessment plan. They're going to be conducting biological surveys to get an understanding of what resources are out there, if there are biological resources, as well as getting some sense of what the physical environment is. They'll conduct probably geologic or geophysical type evaluations to get an understanding of the physical environment. Um, so what they will do is, in a um, site assessment plan, they will describe those studies that they will uh, intend to uh, conduct on their leasehold, as well as if they want to you know, deploy a meteorological buoy or construct a meteorological tower, that also has to be described in this site assessment plan. And what we will do is we will conduct the environmental and technical reviews of that plan so we understand what the implications are to the environment, as well as to make sure that anything that is constructed or deployed into the marine environment is technically suitable. The lessee, once a site assessment plan has been approved, because that has to be approved before they can um, conduct those activities in their plan, they have up to five years to collect that data. If they have um, previous data or, or they can collect their environmental data in less than five years, that's great. What we wanted to do is give a sufficient amount of time to be able to collect data and take into account Mother Nature sometimes uh, causes delays in, in survey, uh, surveys and things like that. But we didn't want to have an open-ended time because what we don't want people to do is acquire leases and sit on them. So we want people who, companies that acquire leases to be able to move through the process. So we figured that five years was reasonable. More, most people will probably end up, uh, most companies will end up collecting their data probably in uh, two to three years. Once they have collected their data, they must file their construction operation plan before the fifth year, by the fifth year, excuse me. If they miss that deadline, we can actually revoke the lease. Again, we don't want people sitting in banking sites. We want people to move through things in, a, in an efficient manner. Stage four is the construction operation. So I've gone out there in my site assessment period and I've collected my data, <coughs> which helps me propose how I intend to build how I intend to generate and then eventually decommission their site. And that all is in this construction operation plan. And what we will do is we'll take that plan, we'll make sure that they have all the components and information that we've requested uh, of them via our regulations, as well as we'll make sure that it is technically suitable, and then we will conduct our environmental impact statement analyses on that. So really drill down deep to understand uh, what the implications are for approving this plan. We can approve the plan. We can approve it with modifications. And what I mean by that is, as we move forward through the NEPA process and doing the, the environmental impact statement analysis, it may be evident that there are certain conditions that must be adhered to to protect, um, whether it's a species or a benthic area or a multiple use. Through our consultations with our resource agencies, such as the National Marine Fisheries Service or Fish and Wildlife Service, it could be with FAA, there might be some operating conditions that have to come into play that we can fold. So we always talk about a, a construction operation plan or a set assessment plan as we can approve them or approve them with these additional operations or, um, or with conditions. A part of the commercial development is a lessee must also prepare a navigational risk assessment because we know it's not just the physical environment and the biological environment, it's the other users. And navigation, particularly uh, commerce, of space, commerce is very, very important. Unfortunately, at our intergovernmental task forces, we have the US Coast Guard uh, at the table to help us with this. But they need to have an understanding of what will this new facility, how it will interface with other uh, maritime, or, uh, maritime activities, and what is the risk to that. If we go ahead and approve a construction operation plan, either as is or with modifications, a lessee then has 25 years to construct, generate, and decommission. There is a renewal provision in our regulations. But if they don't renew, after that 25 year period, the lease expires and they must decommission their facility. One of the questions we're asked about this is, um, what happens if something happens to the company during that 25 years and they go out of business? You know, who's gonna, who's gonna take down the facilities? We do have bonds and financial assurances that in order to build these facilities, certain financial assurances and guarantees must be in place. So if something untoward would occur, it is not our obligation as the federal government or yours as, as a citizenry, but it is those bonds that we will cash to make sure that the facility is cleaned up and removed. As I mentioned before, we have formal opportunity for comment when we, when we have a 
to ask Diego, uh, for example, would be a public comment opportunity. When we, when we begin to look at construction operation plan, we'll have public hearings and there'll be formal comment periods. So we'll have that opportunity to, to, to talk to one another that way and through federal register notices and, and those sorts of dialogue. But we also intend to continue to come up here as long as Bill and Bruce will host us and have stakeholder meetings and other public information meetings. And of course, we have our intergovernmental task forces. And I'd be remiss in, in not identifying, we do have some of the uh, federal uh, memberships here. We have uh, US Coast Guard, EPA, and, and Corps of Engineers is here. So there are opportunities for us to continue the dialogue uh, throughout this process. So more specifically, well, let's talk about this call area and its evolution. And I feel pretty proud of this because, you know, you have in concept in the world this consultative coordinated process to move through the system. And, you know, it's all just, it was conceptual when we published it in 2009. Well, what happened is it actualized. And I feel pretty good about that because it's not us coming in and saying, this is where we're going to be. And, Let's figure out what's wrong with it. It was this dialogue with our intergovernmental task forces, working with the uh, Commonwealth and its working groups to be able to get to this point here in the call. But we did publish a request for interest that was huge back in December of 2010. And one of the things that we quickly discovered when we came up here to do some information meetings in February 2011 is we weren't doing the best job we could in reaching out to get to stakeholders that were not around our intergovernmental task force table. So what the Commonwealth did was they helped us resolve that kind of disconnect by creating the two work groups that, that Bruce and uh, Bill mentioned, the Fisheries Working Group and the Habitat Working Group. As a result of that request for interest, uh, what we did was we, we realized we weren't connecting with folks, because not everybody reads the Federal Register first thing in the morning. I don't understand why not. But anyway, we extended that comment period for this request for interest. And so that allowed the, the stakeholders, after they, we went through our information meetings, to go back, take a look at the notice, and then give us some really good input. And what we ended up doing in May 2011 was removing that 56% of the RFI area. We received over um, 240 comments, and we did receive 11 expressions of interest. So we know that there is commercial interest in this area. The reason why that's important is to do studies and analytics in the marine environment is very expensive. And if there were not to have, we were to have any kind of commercial interest in the area, then there was no point in moving forward. So that's why we need the environmental information, the use, user's information, as well as that uh, commercial interest to make sure that if we're going to move forward in an area, we're aware of issues and concerns, as well as we're moving forward in an area that there's actual interest in actualizing some sort of generation. So I circle back to the first slide. And again, we developed this in consultation with our intergovernmental task forces and all the other tools available to us. And what we want from that call is more information. And we had a meeting with the Habitat group uh, before this session here, and, and somebody who remained nameless said, well, geez, you know, part of our challenge is we don't have a lot of information. All we can give you is questions and issues. Bring it on, because we need to understand what those questions and issues are. We do have available to the Bureau, as well as the sister agencies that sit around the Intergovernmental Task Forces, ability to go out to stakeholders or to fund <laughs> studies. So it's good that if we don't have data, if you have questions and concerns with regard to the call area, you need to help us by informing us of what those issues and questions and comments are. As I mentioned, we're seeking industry nominations in addition to the environmental don't want to be moving forward in the area if there is no industry interest. As I mentioned earlier, we will complete an area identification based on the information we receive in response to our call for information and nominations. That'll help us take a look at, do we need to do some further refinement? We heard some information at the public session in Martha's Vineyard about fin whales and some other fishing considerations. So we're going to upload all that and see if we need to tweak or refine this call area. And then the next step will be whatever that area would be, whatever that polygon will be, will become the area identification that will be equal to the proposed action in our environmental assessment. I know it was a lot of bureaucraties, but basically we're now starting to win and frame what are we going to evaluate um, for the implications associated with leasing, doing some of these surveys and data collection, as well as construction of meteorological 
meteorological towers at deployment of net buoys. So that's that proposed action area. The notice of intent to prepare an EA. Um, we're using the Secretary's Smart from the Start process where we have divided our NEPA analysis into two phases. The first phase, we're really going to focus on what is allowed under that lease and what the first uh, phase that's allowed under a lease that would be issued is conducting these site characterization and site assessment activities. So we thought it was very natural for us to then take a look at those types of activities in an environmental assessment. As all of you know, an environmental assessment is the first step of NEPA. Some people can go straight to an EIS if they believe there'll be significant impacts, but if you don't know, you can start with an EA, you do your analytics, you see if you can arrive at a finding of no significant impact, and if so, you're finished. If not, then you go ahead and do an EIS. So we decided to employ that particular methodology to our leasing activity associated with wind energy areas. Because the underlying hope is that we've done enough refining where we, go, where we have eliminated or at least reduced obvious conflicts with physical environment, biological resources, as well as users in the area. So this is kind of what we're testing here. Again, if we do the EA, and in this scenario, of evaluating the impacts associated with the surveys and the other information gathering, the deployment of the, the scientific instruments. We find that there are significant impacts, then we move to the EIS. If not, we stay at that finding of no significant impacts, and we can use that NEPA document to support our leasing activities. In addition, we must um, complete all our consultations and file, follow all federal laws. So it's not just that we do NEPA and, we, and that we're done with it. We have our consultation required under the National Historic Preservation Act with tribes. We do our resource consultations with Fish and Wildlife Service, National Marine Fisheries Service, et cetera. So we have to follow the law. What we wanted to talk about a little bit, and I've kind of highlighted this already, is the EA and the scope of this EA. And the key thing here is the EA will not cover all activities of issuing the lease all the way to commission. As I said, under the Secretary Smart from the start, we are decoupling the construction, generation, and operation decommissioning to when we have a construction operation plan filed. Because we believe at that time, we will have specific information as to the types of machines, the density of machines, where they intend to uh, come to shore with their transmission. There'll be more meaningful information available to us so that environmental impact statement analysis can be very robust and informed. So what we're doing instead is what we've done in the Mid-Atlantic is this EA that focuses on issuing the lease and collecting information. So there is that difference. So when commenting on the NOI, we're really looking for you to provide us information on those site assessment and characterization activities and, and concerns and issues associated with that. So for example, if there is a specific sensitive benthic area that if we had uh, moorings from a met tower, excuse me, a met buoy put in that, that could be negatively affected, we need to know that. You can also give us information associated with concerns for development, but we're going to hold those and apply those later. Another thing that we're really looking forward uh, for receiving information on or some ideas and insight into are alternatives. Alternative analysis is always fairly uh, complicated, and we always want to find some really suitable, appropriate alternatives. So in responding to the NOI, the Notice of Intent for the EA, to come up with alternatives will, will be um, helpful. <coughs> And what we will do, we'll upload the NOI information and we will build a scenario on the site assessment and site characterization activities for whatever area that's the area ID. The area ID will be our uh, outline, our polygon in the ocean that we're going to focus all our efforts on. And what we will do in addition is we take a look at two types of main activities, routine, and then unfortunate accidents are non-routine. So again, thinking about the kinds of information you can give us, non-routine activities, you know, what has been, if there's some data on implications associated with facilities or severe storms that run through this area, or questions and concerns, that's what we're looking to receive through our NOI, so we can have a robust um, scenario. These are examples of socioeconomic conditions and issues that we will take a look at. And again, I encourage you to go to our website at www.doe.gov and look at the Mid-Atlantic EA. 
not so much for the analytics, but for the table of contents, because then you get a sense of the breadth and scope of issues that we do take a look at. These are um, some of the physical and biological resources that we take a look at. Mm -hmm. We also do cumulative impacts, and I think up here it's going to be a really fascinating cumulative impact analysis because we know right, right next door we have the area of mutual interest, and we know that we're, we're having some opportunities there with regard to area identification. That should be uh, forthcoming in the next several weeks at area ID stage for the Rhode Island, Massachusetts area of mutual interest. So what we, do, we will do in our EA is the cumulative impact assessment is going to take into consideration those activities that may be ongoing in the AMI. These are just some of the consultations that we engage in. And I want to really come in strong here. It's not that we do the EA with the supposition where we get to the cost. We believe there is a good chance because of the wonderful dialogue we've had with the intergovernmental task forces and with you all in trying to eliminate obvious conflicts. But if we cannot result, if our EA analysis does not result in the finding of no significant impact, we will then move to an EIS. But if it does, this is the utility and kind of the, at the heart of the efficiencies in SMART from the start. If our EA to support leasing results in a FONSI, finding of no significant impact, when that lessee files its site assessment plan with us, the hope is we had a really robust scenario and analytics that when we evaluate that plan and its activities, it's covered by that EA. Because then we will not need to do another EA. However, if it is not, if we take a look at the uh, proposed uh, data collection activities and the construction of a MET tower, and we see that you know we've missed something or, it's, or there's some nuances there, we will then need to supplement, if not prepare a new EA. So the hope is, with your all's help and giving us good information, that that EA scenario can be robust enough to cover the kinds of activities we believe will be proposed under these site assessment plans. The construction of MET towers, the deployment of meteorological buoys, the data collection, biological, physical, as well as multiple use data collection. So again, that's kind of the frame for our EA. So here's um, some of the comments and responses that, that we have asked in, uh, in our notices. And you see the call not only asks for the commercial interest, but takes a look at specific issues and resources. It's not the be-all, end-all list. It just is kind of used there to jog folks um, in, in, or inspire people as to the kinds of things that we're, we're looking for in this area. But I think, again, as was pointed out in um, the Habitat Working Group uh, uh, meeting, was that it's probably not so much that we have data, but we have questions. Mm -hmm. So again, please give those, um, please submit those in response to the call as well as the NOI. And we've been through this, and I think, again, it's important to take a look at issues and alternatives. And if you have some uh, interest in cumulative impact and, and some of those issues, please, this is the way to communicate with us so we have it on record as so when we go and develop the scenario and we run <coughs> our scenario of our chain of command, we have some really good support for the direction we have taken. Comments are due on the 22nd, and you have a variety of methodology to come in and submit them to us. You can go to the website at www.regulations.gov, keying in the uh, ID, and send your comments that way, and they'll be posted, as well as you can email me or snail mail me, and we will then post the comments. But it is important uh, to please interact with us in this manner, as well as please come up and, and tell us what your issues and concerns are now so we can get those in the record, we can design the next step, this area identification, fully informed, we can build a robust EA that can be useful and effective. 